Hi there. So this is going to be the first in a series of videos on the different types of vaccines. Now, uh, these are the five types of vaccines we're going to cover in these videos. The first being live attenuated vaccines, also known as weakened vaccines. Um, and that'll be the focus of this video. Later videos will focus on killed or inactivated vaccines, subunit vaccines, uh, nucleic acid vaccines that contain DNA or RNA, and finally, vector vaccines. And again, the whole point of vaccination is to trick the body into generating a strong immune response, hopefully B-cell and T-cell mediated, so that if we are exposed to the real pathogen, the real dangerous pathogen, that uh, that pathogen will not either be able to infect us, or if it can't does infect us, will not be able to cause disease. So let's start off with live attenuated vaccines, which are really the gold standard for vaccines. They seem to produce the best immune response and the best protection, most likely because they are in fact a real infection. So examples of live attenuated vaccines include measles, mumps, rubella, chickenpox, shingles, some versions of those virus, uh, vaccines, rotavirus vaccines, and um, the oral polio vaccine. So uh, the reason that many of these vaccines are very good and provide lifelong protection is because you are in fact infected by these viruses when you get the vaccine or the immunization. But these the vaccine, these uh, viral vaccines um, have been mutated in such a way that they can infect you, but they do not cause disease. They have lost their ability to um, cause disease, but they can infect you, which is good because infections allow the immune system to mount a defense. So when you are um, injected with the, for example, MMR vaccine, you are in fact infected by a measles virus, a mumps virus, and a rubella virus. And so those viruses can infect your cells, but they, again, they do not cause disease, and we'll see why uh, in the next slide. And they have also lost their ability to replicate at typically very high numbers. They actually replicate quite poorly. So they can still infect your cells, they can enter your cells, they can produce viral genetic material, they can produce viral protein, um, but they're not doing such a great job at it. Um, and uh, this allows your immune system to mount a wonderful attack against that pathogen because it's a real infection. Um, and so cells like dendritic cells and other professional antigen presenting cells will either become infected by this virus or take it in via uh, endocytosis, phagocytosis. And since this is a real infection, uh, the pathogen proteins are going to be presented on MHC class one and MHC class two molecules. And that allows us to have an excellent response uh, by the immune system, by the adaptive immune system. And that's what we're looking for here, an adaptive immune system response. So hopefully you would have naive uh, T cells, both of the CD4 and the CD8 kind that have T cell receptors that recognize peptides from that pr pathogen, uh, from its proteins. And also, since you are making this virus in your body, again, at very low levels, though, um, that you will have some naive B cells that will uh, be uh, containing a B cell receptor, which means it has an immunoglobulin that has maybe an antigen binding site that binds proteins uh, or other molecules on the surface of the pathogen. So this real infection will allow you to have a real adaptive immune response, which means you will be generating a B cell and a T cell response. You will be generating antibodies, plasma cells, um, activated T cells, cytotoxic T cells, helper CD4 T cells that are secreting cytokines. And so um, you will generate an immune response to this pathogen. And that immune response uh, typically also generates memory cells, memory B cells, and memory T cells that contain either uh, the B cell receptor slash immunoglobulin that remembers this pathogen or T cells that have T cell receptors that recognize peptides from this antigen. And so that if you are ever exposed to these pathogens 
later in life, if you get a, you're exposed to measles or exposed to mumps or exposed to polio or rotavirus, that you have um, already B cells and T cells that recognize that pathogen. So the B cells might be already producing, the memory B cells uh, might have already uh, been able to prevent the infection by secreting, uh, by turning in the plasma cells very quickly and producing neutralizing antibodies. The memory T cells will be destroying uh, uh, the infected cells, the CD8 memory T cells. Uh, the CD4 memory T cells will be uh, inducing inflammation and then doing everything else that the CD4 T cells do. And so these uh, types of vaccines, live attenuated vaccines, tend to give you a very robust immunity to a pathogen and typically lifelong immunity, lifelong protection. Um, now let's talk about how one goes about attenuating or weakening a virus, right? If you're um, getting uh, the measles vaccine, your MMR shot, you're getting injected by the measles virus, but that virus isn't causing disease. Why isn't it causing disease? Well, it's been weakened or attenuated because it's been grown in the lab and allowed to evolve away its ability to cause disease. So now we have to think about evolution here. And if you think about, if you recall evolution from freshman biology, you remember things like variation and um, selection and adaptation. So that's exactly what's going to happen to uh, these viruses when scientists want to attenuate or weaken them. They allow them to evolve away their ability to cause disease. So how does uh, one do this? Well, in the laboratory, you can grow the virus, right? We can grow viruses in the lab very well. But what we want to do when we want to attenuate or weaken a virus is we grow it in a um, cell type, for example, that it's not normally grown in. Maybe grow it in a non-human cell type, like a chicken cell or a monkey cell. And you select for mutants of the virus in the laboratory that are not virulent, that will not cause disease in humans, that maybe will replicate poorly in human cells. So if you take a virus like, you know, a, you know, a uh, the measles virus um, that causes disease in humans and you grow it in the laboratory, you infect cells in the laboratory, well, you can generate more of this virus. But what you're going to do here is you're going to select for the virus that is less virulent, less able to replicate in human cells. And so you can keep passaging this virus. You take this virus, you grow it, you collect it, you select for the ones that you want, and you grow those again in, human, in uh, the non-human cells. You collect those viruses, you passage them again. And through this repeated passaging in uh, the laboratory, what you're really doing is you're selecting for the natural mutations that occur in any organism that replicates. So you, again, have to recall uh, this concept in evolution um, really, it's a concept from genetics, is that uh, replicating uh, genetic material, that's never perfect. There are always mutations occur when uh, genetic material, such as DNA, is replicated. So mutations that naturally occur in every organism that uses genetic material to replicate, right? Um, so as you're growing this virus in the lab and you're passaging it and you're growing again and you're passaging it, mutations are naturally occurring. And scientists are selecting for those mutants because that uh, these mutants have given the virus an ability to adapt to these different type of cells. And now they have lost an ability to replicate well in human cells, or they've lost the ability to cause disease in the human body. And scientists will select for these um, mutants in the laboratory. So this is a type of artificial selection. So when you think about humans artificially selecting organisms, you think about, you know, how we select for plants that yield the best uh, amount of uh, fruits or vegetables or, uh, you know, breeding dogs to have certain traits. So humans have been doing artificial, artificial selection in plants and animals for millennia. Now humans are doing artificial selection 
of viruses in the laboratory. And viruses grow very quick, so you can have very many generations or passages of these viruses in the laboratory and then test them in human cells uh, to ensure that they uh, have lost their ability to replicate well, they've lost their ability to cause disease. So this is a type of artificial selection that's occurring in the laboratory. And so I'll give you an example of the measles virus, again, which was uh, isolated from a person, grown in the laboratory, um, passaged, you know, and had an artificially selected, right, artificial selection, you know, selecting for mutants that uh, could grow well in these chicken cells, but no longer grew well in human cells. And so this attenuated measles virus, when it is given to humans, does not cause disease. But it'll replicate poorly, but replicate enough that it will generate a B-cell and a T-cell response, giving an individual lifelong immunity, in most cases, um, to the uh, pathogen. Uh, same thing, for example, the rubella virus uh, was taken out of a person, grown in the laboratory. Now, Rubella normally infects epithelial cells in the human. That's when it infects and causes disease. In the laboratory, it was uh, adapted to grow in human fibroblasts, not its natural host cell type. But upon repeated passaging in those fibroblasts, it adapted to those cells. Again, how do things adapt in, uh, how do living things, although you might not consider viruses living things, how do they adapt? Mutations that naturally occur. Scientists select for the mutants that grow well in the fibroblasts and grow poorly in the epithelial cells. And eventually generated an attenuated rubella virus, which again, uh, does not cause disease in humans. And our final example here will be uh, polio. Uh, there are different polio vaccines. There's the Salk and the Sabin vaccines. Here we're talking about the Sabin vaccine also known as the oral live vaccine. So again, the virus was grown in the laboratory in monkey kidney cells, not its natural host, but it was passaged there repeatedly. Mutants were selected for um, by their ability to grow poorly in human cells. And after repeated passaging in these monkey kidney cells, the polio virus uh, attained enough mutations that uh, allowed the virus to grow in the lab, in monkey kidney cells, well, but grow poorly in human cells and uh, not cause disease in humans. So that attenuated polio virus, uh, when you're given the oral live vaccine, uh, the virus infects your cells, the virus replicates, but the virus typically does not cause disease. So that is uh, live attenuated vaccines typically the gold standard for vaccines because they really seem to produce a strong immune response to the real pathogen and that immune response tends to give lifelong immunity which is what we would love to do now if we're not getting lifelong immunity maybe we might need booster shots maybe we might need repeated vaccinations and you'll see that in the other uh examples of vaccines that uh the Immunity maybe is not lifelong, so it requires uh, more bo shots, booster shots, um, repeated injections, but uh, li the live attenuated vaccines are, are definitely the gold standard in terms of mimicking infection and getting the immune system to mount a robust immune response to the pathogen.